Hello everyone, and welcome to this video on similar matrices and linear transformations. Uh, more specifically, we're going to be talking about linear operators. Uh, that's a linear transformation where the domain and codomain are the same, the same space, the same vector space. And even if you're looking at a linear transformation between two vector spaces with the same dimension, right, say they're both dimension n, um, well, in that case, you can, you know, represent it as a transformation between Rn and Rn. Remember, every n-dimensional vector space is isomorphic to Rn, right, the Euclidean vector space with n dimensions. So I'm just going to specifically talk about linear operators uh, here, right, where the domain and codomain are the same vector space. And uh, what we're going to see here, right, in the beginning of the video, I'm going to refresh your memory as to what the fundamental theorem of matrix representations states. We'll go through that in some notation. Uh, and then we're going to apply the fundamental theorem of matrix representations to specifically linear operators and not just general linear transformations. And in the end of that, you're going to see that for linear operators, the standard matrix, all right, which is the matrix representation with respect to the standard basis for the, and I'm just going to say, I'm not going to say bases, because now the we're talking about operators, the domain and codomain will be the same, so I'll just say standard basis, you know, for, for both of them. Uh, what we're going to see is that for a linear op operator, the standard matrix of a linear operator will be similar to a matrix representation for that operator with respect to any other basis, any other non-standard basis uh, of the domain and codomain. All right. So yeah, that, that's going to be a big result that we're going to see in this video. And then of course I'll go over a couple examples demonstrating this. Okay. So first on the similarity of matrix representations for linear operators. Um, again, before I get to talking about just linear operators, I'll talk about linear transformations in general. So it's going to be a recap here. Recall back, you know, been a few videos ago, I talked about the fundamental theorem of matrix representations. So here's what that stated. So suppose we have a, trans a linear transformation T from vector space U to vector space V. All right. With the dimension of the domain U being N, and say the dimension of the codomain V is M. With uh, say E1 is the standard basis for U, all right, the standard basis for the domain. And E2, we'll say, is the standard basis for the codomain V. And then let's suppose we are working also with you know, some other non-standard bases for the domain and codomain. Uh, so suppose this B represents a basis for the domain, U. And this C represents a basis for the codomain V. All right, and then some notation we came across in, again, previous videos, if you've been watching following along. Uh, typically, I use the, the matrix, the, the capital letter A for the standard matrix for T. Now, you could also express this using this matrix representation symbolism. All right, this is the matrix representation for T with respect to, you know, the standard bases. E1 and E2. Uh, if you're if you're using the same notation as uh, this 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 you've seen before, I'm hoping. So you could also express the standard matrix this way, but I per you know just capital A. Every time I've seen capital A, it's been the standard matrix uh, for a, for a transformation. And then this little bracket around T here. 
and then you know basis B, basis C. You have the basis of the domain as a subscript, the basis of the of the codomain as a superscript. This represents the this is the matrix representation for T, you know, with respect to the you know the, the bases B and C for the domain and codomain respectively. So, like I said, you know, you could you could call the standard matrix the matrix representation with respect to the standard bases for the domain and codomain. You know, you could write it like this if you wanted, but again, I'm just going to use A. All right, and then there were some transition matrices involved. I haven't even gotten to the statement statement of the theorem yet. Uh, there was this P sub B matrix. This was the transition matrix or the change of coordinates matrix from basis E1 to B. So the standard from the you know, changing from coordinates relative to the standard basis of the domain to this other basis of the domain. And another way you could express that also is this P with the E1 arrow B like this, you know, going from right to left as it's usually notated. And PC is very similar, but just for the, the bases of the codomain. This P sub C is the transition matrix or the change of coordinates matrix from you know base the standard basis of the codomain to the basis C of the codomain. And another way to notate that would be P with the little E2 arrow C, right like this. Alright, so all this notation out there. So again, suppose I have a linear transformation called T from vector space U to vector space V. And all these notations for bases and matrices. Then, for every vector U in the domain, for all U in the domain, U. PC times T of U will be equal to the matrix representation with respect to B and C multiplied by PB times U. And both of these represent the coordinates of the output, the coordinates of T of U with res relative to basis C. Right? Both of these represent that same thing. And if you'd like to get the standard matrix involved, Remember, T of U is equivalent to the standard matrix times U. So we could say also that PC times A times U should be equivalent to the you know, TBC here, matrix representation of T with respect to bases B and C, times PB times U. All right. So this was called you know, the, 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 the fundamental theorem of matrix representations. And it was, you know, this applied to any linear transformation. Right? Notice I started off with, you know, this is any linear transformation. And then from this statement, you know, I can do a little manipulation here. If I were to subtract, say, the right side to the left side here, and then factor out the U, remember matrix multiplication is distributive over matrix addition, U is on the right side of both of these, so I could factor out U on the right, and I'd be left with the zero matrix, or the zero vector on the left, on the right side now, sorry. And then the left, after factoring U out, I'm seeing PC times A, minus, you know, TBC times PB, times U will be equal to the zero vector. Now remember, this statement has to be true for every vector in the domain. So the only matrix for which every vector times that matrix will be the zero vector, the only matrix for which that will happen is the zero matrix itself. So this PC times A minus TC, TBC times PB, this matrix must be the zero matrix. And then I add this back to both sides. So these matrices, these products must be equal. PC times A must be equivalent to TBC, you know, the T with respect to B and C here, times PB. And then if I want to solve for this matrix representation with respect to B and C, I multiply on the right of both sides by PB inverse. Right. So we have t the, the matrix representation of T with respect to B and C equals PC times A times PB inverse. And that's a lot. Right? That's a lot of notation, a lot of equation manipulation. 
and you know I haven't used any any actual vectors or actual numbers and uh, you know it can be a bit confusing at first I understand that um, but you have seen this before all right so now this statement right here you know this statement this state all these statements I've just written should hold true right will be a true statement for any linear transformation and then with respect to you know any basis B for the domain and any basis C for the codomain. Uh, what I'm going to work with now, oh, sorry, before I get to the linear operators, there was also, you know, this picture that I had up uh, in a previous video showing you how this kind of worked. All right, so up here I have, you know, ba vector space U, vector space V, you know, with respect to the standard basis, you know, basis E1, basis E2. And uh, down here I have the same vector spaces U and V, but you know, we're, we're looking at coordinates with respect to different bases, you know, basis B for U and basis C for V. So suppose I started with a vector from U, right? Take any vector from U, call it little u here. Now I can plug it into the transformation T, which will take me to T of U. Right? And these are you know, technically coordinates with respect to the standard bases that's understood. I plug it in, I get T of U, but if you plug in a vector to T, your output, remember if it's a linear transformation, should also be that, you know, written, can also be written as that standard matrix A times the input vector U. So I get T of U or A times U. And then, well, okay, now I would like to take this vector, this t of u, or this a times u, and express it as, a, as its coordinates with respect to a different basis, right, with respect to basis c. And that's where this transition matrix pc comes in, right, going from the standard basis e2 to the basis c. I multiply this by pc. So my output here is, you know, the coordinates of t, you know, I, pl I put t of u in through this, over here I get the coordinates of T of U with respect to basis C. And that's just taking AU times PC, right? PC times AU in that order, PC times AU. Or you could say PC times T of U like I have down here. So this, this are both giving me the coordinate vector of T of U with respect to basis C. Well, that was one direction I could take to get to this coordinate vector of T of U with respect to basis C. Another direction I could take is start with my vector U from the domain, you know, with coordinates relative to the standard basis E1. Change those coordinates so that we have coordinates of U relative to the basis B. Right, so I'm going from U to the coordinates of U relative to B. Well, in order to do that, that's where this transition, ma transition matrix PB comes in. I multiply by PB. So this coordinates of u with respect to b is pb times my original vector u. And then, and I want to get over here, to, ch to I'm going to, to ha if my input, if my input is in coordinates with respect to b, and I would like my output to be in coordinates with respect to c, that's where this matrix representation with respect to b and c comes in. This represents a mapping of coordinates relative to B to coordinates relative to C. So I pop this in here, basically multiply this by this transition, this um, this matrix representation with respect to B and C, and I get the same output I got going the other direction. So we have a T B C there, the matrix representation with respect to B and C, multiplied by the matrix the coordinate vector of u with respect to b, well that's the tbc times pb times u, and that'll give me the same result as these other two I had going from the other direction. And all of these things, all of these things down here in the right cor lower right corner represent the coordinates of the output with respect to a basis c of the, of the codomain. Right. So now, all right, this little picture, Right, this fundamental theorem of matrix representations, this applied 
to any tr linear transformation, any one at all. But so it, what I'm going to do is apply it to a very specific kind of linear transformation, right? Called a, a linear operator, where instead of two, you know, separate, two different, or distinct vector spaces being the co domain and codomain, what if they were the same? All right, what if they were the same? So I'm going to go over pretty much the same thing as I just showed you with the fundamental theorem. But this time we're going to apply the fundamental theorem. All right, now apply the fundamental, I forgot to put the word theorem in there earlier, the fundamental theorem of matrix representations to a linear operator. So that's a linear transformation from you know a vector space to the same vector space, V to V, or U to U if you wanted to do that. But so I don't need to mention the dimension of both of them, right? I you know, just put one, the, where the dimension of V is N, right? So my standard matrix would be an N by N matrix, square matrix. And instead of having E1 and E2, you know, for separate bases, you know, the standard bases of the domain and codomain, well, the domain and codomain are the same. So I'm just going to use, you know, E, for the standard basis for both. Right? It's the standard basis for V. And you could have a, a basis B for the domain V and have another basis called C for the domain, the codomain V. Uh, but we're going to simplify this here and apply the fundamental theorem to simply where I'm just transitioning from basis B to basis B again. I'm going to use the same basis for both the domain and codomain. All right, so instead of B and C, I'm just using B. All right, B is a basis for both the domain and codomain we're looking at here. All right, so then again, A will represent the standard matrix for this operator, for this transformation, which you could abbreviate this way. You know, the matrix representation with respect to the standard basis for the domain, you know, the, the basis for the domain is the standard basis. The basis for the codomain is also the standard basis, so you have EE. E. But what you're going to notice in a lot of books is that this, if, if the basis for the domain and codomain are the same, they only write it once. So I could write, I could express a, I could express this standard matrix for T as the matrix represent, representation for T with respect to standard basis E. Right? And just mention it once and it will be implied that the two vector spaces, the domain and codomain, have the are, are using the same basis. So that's exactly kind of what I have in this next line. All right, this notation with the bracket around T, the, you know, the standard, uh, the, I'm sorry, the matrix representation for T with respect to basis B, that just means that the basis for the domain is B and the basis for the codomain that we're working with is also B. You could also express it this way, but again, usually you won't see it where the, the two bases are the same. If they're the same, they'll usually just write it once as a subscript. And then the same stuff, PB will represent the transition matrix from the standard basis for V to basis B for V, right? Or you could notate it P from E to B like this. All right. And notice there's no PC because, you know, this time B and C are the same set. They're the same basis. And then all the stu same stuff holds, you know, just going back to this statement earlier. I'm just, this, this, this should, this should hold, right, for anything. Except, you know, it's just, it's just that now I'm replacing all these C's with B's, right? So I have P, B here. And then this would be just the matrix, trans matrix re representation with respect to, you know, basis B and basis B. So just basis B. And that's it, right? That's the only thing that would really change. And that's what I have written here. All right, then for every vector in the domain, which I call V, for every vector in the domain, PB times T of V should be equal to the, you know, the matrix representation with respect to basis B times PB times V, right? And that's a V, sorry, it's kind of clunky. And both of these represent the coordinates of T of V with respect to basis B. 
Now again, if you wanted to use the standard matrix here, right? remember T of V is the same as A times V. So I could also have said that PB times A times V equals the matrix representation with respect to B times PB times V. And as I said, as I did earlier, we can then state that you know if this is going to be true for every vector in the domain, then these two matrix products have to be equal. So PB times A has to be equal to this matrix representation with respect to B times PB. And look at this, look at this. Notice how the matrices on the outside of this equation are the same, and they're invertible. Right? Remember, PB should be an invertible matrix. All your transition matrices are invertible, change of coordinates matrices. So I have these invertible matrices on the outside of this, and then closest to the inside, you know, to the equals, are A and this, this transition matrix, uh, this matrix representation with respect to B, A and this TB here. Now, if you recall from last video, this means that A and this matrix representation TB are similar. Right, so the standard matrix for a linear operator and its matrix with respect to a different basis, right, this is the matrix with respect to the standard basis, and its matrix with respect to really any basis are going to be similar matrices. And in fact, you know, you can you know, manipulate this equation, multiply both sides on the right by PB inverse. We'll see that the matrix TB, rep the matrix representation with respect to basis B is PB times A times PB inverse. And again, this may look familiar from last video, right? what it meant for two matrices to be similar. And in fact, I've put up the definition again here on this page. Two matrices A and B are similar if there is an invertible matrix, you know, called M, or whatever you want to call it, as long as it's invertible, such that M times A equals B times M. All right, if I multiply one matrix on the left by M and the other matrix on the right by M and get the same same result then those matrices are similar, A and B are similar. And manipulating this, you could say that A equals B times you know, that matrix and its inverse on either side, or B equals A times that matrix and its inverse on either side. And that's exactly what we have here with the standard matrix of a linear operator and its matrix representation with respect to it any other basis. I see that if I multiply one on the left by PB and the other on the right by PB, I'd get the same result. Or one of them is equal to the other one multiplied by PB and its inverse on either side. So they are similar. All right. Wonderful. So that, all right, I know, I know. It's been 20 some minutes and I haven't gotten to a single example. It's, just, it's a been very notation heavy this video, as was the video on fundamental theorem of matrix representations. But now, all right, now, let's get to some examples. So I have examples here of linear operators, right, where the domain and, and codomain are the same set, the same vector space. So my first example, and, and for both of the examples I have, um, we're going to be finding this first the standard matrix. Remember, this is the matrix with respect to the standard bases for the domain and codomain, and the matrix representation with respect to a different basis, right? some basis B of the domain and codomain, this TB for the given linear operator T. Now I've told you it's linear, you don't have to show that it's linear, right? No, so it should, the, 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 the rule should satisfy the additivity and homogeneity properties, you don't need to check that. All right. And then afterwards I'm going to show that these matrices are similar. Right. We're going to show that, there's, that, that A, the standard matrix, and then this TB, this matrix with respect to basis B, are similar. All right. 
So here I have an operator, t, from you know, r2 to r2. Uh, the standard basis, right, little e here, is you know one zero zero one. The other basis I'm going to be working with, another basis for r2 is this set here, say b is a two five and one three, right? You know it spans r2 and these are linearly independent, right? It's another basis, a non-standard basis. And here's the rule for t, you know. Where, where right now these vectors, you know, anytime you know, when we're given a rule for t, usually it starts off, you know, if they don't if they don't mention it, right? If there are no subscripts on these, you know, it's it's assumed then that these are with respect to the standard basis, right? These are coordinates relative to the standard basis. Right? When you talk about the input and output of t, right? If if it's if it's not mentioned, if there aren't any subscripts. All right. So first, I'll find the standard matrix. Remember, there are a couple ways you could do this. All right. The first way was just you know. A standard matrix. I'm going from the standard basis of R2 to the standard basis of R2. Um, so I just find find the images of the standard bases. So I find what's T of you know the standard basis vectors. You know one zero. And if I plugged in you know one for x, zero for y, I'd get you know the vector one two. Which hopefully you can also see are just the coefficients of x, and this is going to be the first column of the standard matrix, and then t of the other standard matrix, the I'm uh, sorry, the other standard basis vector zero one is you know zero for x, one for y. So I'm just getting the coefficients of y, right, negative two and three, as the second column, right, and these here. Now, normally, you know, if this, if I said with respect to a different basis, you know, these are coordinates with respect to the standard basis right now, I would have to change it to, you know, if there was a different basis I was working with, I would have to change these, translate these to their coordinates with respect to that other basis. But right now, this is all we want, from standard basis of R2 to standard basis of R2, and that's what these are in. So, my standard matrix is the two by two matrix with you know one two as the first column, negative two three as the second column. All right. All right. Then I'm going to show. I'm going to find this matrix here, right? This T B. And then after I'm going to find that transition matrix P B and P B inverse, right? Because we. I'll bring back that page showing that I need to find that to, to, to demonstrate that this matrix A and the matrix representation with respect to basis B are similar. So two, I'm going to find that matrix representation of T with respect to basis B. All right. So it starts off the same way. All right, first, and I find the images of the basis vectors from B. All right, so what is uh, what is T of you know two five? Well, if I plug in two for x and five for y into the rule up here, that'd be two minus ten, so negative eight for the first coordinate. Uh, first component, sorry. Uh, and then 4 plus 15, or 19, for the second. Right. Now, this is not going to be the first column of the of this matrix, right? What I need to do next is, you know, because I'm going from basis B to basis B, right? Right now, I'm, you know, this output, remember these outputs here, 
I mentioned at the top are relative to the standard basis. Right, so right now this negative 8, 19, these are coordinates relative to the standard basis. I would need to change them into coordinates relative to basis B, which I'll do after I find this second image. So T of, you know, the other, the second basis vector in B is 1, 3. And then again, replacing X with 1, Y with 3. 1 minus 6, so negative 5 for the first coordinate, first component. 2 plus 9, get 11 for the, for the second. And again, let's double check that real quick in my head. 1 minus 6, 2 plus 9, okay. Looks, uh, looks good. Alright, now again, these are as I mentioned up top, these are not what I want yet. Right? right now, these are outputs from T. These are relative to the standard basis at the moment, right? these coordinates. I would like to translate them so that we're relative to basis B. Right. So remember, there are a couple ways you could do that. One was where I make, and I'll do it this one way that I've, uh, where where I have an augmented matrix. Where on the right side I put these images, you know, negative uh, for the first vector negative eight nineteen, for the second vector negative five eleven, and I'm trying to put these, you know, find the coordinates of these vectors relative to the basis B vectors, right? So I put the basis B vectors over here in the same order. Remember the image of two five, so I want it was first, so I want two five first. 1, 3, second, and, uh, you know, put this into reduced echelon form or reduced row echelon form, which I will do on my calculator. All right, so this is a 2 by 4 augmented matrix. All right, so go into the matrix menu. All right. Looks like this is kind of delayed on me, so I'm going to pause the recording and get all this entered and come back. Okay, we're back. And uh, so I entered this 2x4 matrix A under the matrix menu and edit and put it, had it, you know, put it into RREF, you know, reduced row echelon form. And in doing so, I'm getting. this here, this is that transition, uh, not that transition matrix, this is the matrix I, I've been asking for. Right. So this is that matrix representation of T with respect to basis B. All right. so I'll write that here. This two by two. Negative 43, negative 26, uh, 78, and 47. All right, so I have the standard matrix, this 1, negative 2, 2, 3. I have this matrix representation of T with respect to basis B. Right. Uh, now let's see if these are similar. Now let's see if these are similar, and they should be. Uh, in order to show that they're similar, remember, I'm just trying to find a matrix. So I'm trying to find an invertible matrix such that if I multiply you know, this on the left by that matrix and this on the right, um, you know, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get the same result, uh, which again, I've written here. Right? So that matrix I'm looking for then is this PB, right? That transition matrix from the standard basis of R2 to basis B of R2. And we'll see that this product will be equal. All right, so that's what I'll do next, is finding that tr transition matrix PB.
right, so, um, so just like before, you know, I'm going from the standard, you know, remember how the other way to notate this was? I'm going from the standard basis of R2 to basis B. Alright, and uh, again, you can, there's, there's some long roundabout ways I've done video a video on this prior to this, uh, if you want to go back. But a very quick way to do it is very similar to how I found this uh, matrix representation earlier. A little matrix, a little, I'm going to make a little augmented matrix here. And then I'm transitioning. I want to take the the basis vectors from E, uh, the basis, the standard basis vectors, one zero and zero one. And right, those go over here, on the right side. And we're transitioning into. I want to write what are the coordinates of these vectors relative to basis B. So I'd be solving you know these two systems at the same time. You know this little augmented. So I put basis B vectors. Now basis B was the vectors. 2, 5, and 1, 3. So then again, the same thing, I put this into reduced row echelon form, and hopefully the calculator is a little speedier this time. Turn it on. Alright, so I go back to the matrix menu, over to edit. And I'm just going to re-enter stuff in this 2x4 here, because it's already a 2x4. Now the first two columns, right, it's already a 2x4, let me just enter the size. And the first two columns are the same, right, they're those vectors from basis B. So I'm not going to change those, I'm just going to change the, the right two columns to the standard basis vectors. Right? So 1 here, 0 here. And one here, and zero above that. Right, one zero and zero one. All right, and then I already put the last thing I entered was reduce Russell on form, so I'm just going to re-enter that. And here we go. All right, so my what we're seeing there. And if you're doing this correctly, right, the identity matrix will show up on the right, on the left, sorry, and then that transition matrix will show up on the right. And if you want to test this out, remember what these are. These represent now the coordinates of these vectors relative to basis B. All right, so if I took 3 times 2, 5, Right, if I took 3 times 2, and we'll test that over here, if I took 3 times the vector 2, 5, and added negative 5, right, 3, negative 5, added negative 5 of the vector 1, 3, that should give me the vector 1, 0. And that works out, right, you have 6 plus negative 5 is 1, 15 plus negative 15 is 0. And then this column here, the negative 1, 2, these are the coordinates of 0, 1 relative to basis B. So if you took negative 1 times 2, 5 plus 2 times 1, 3, you should get the vector 0, 1. And again, double check that, and yeah, negative 2 plus 2 is 0, negative 5 plus 6 is 1, works out. Alright, so this is our transition matrix. This is our PB. And then the matrix earlier, this where the columns are just the vectors from B, that would be PB inverse. Because right. like this, setting this up is like, you know, PB, uh, this matrix here times what would give me the identity, you know, if I had this, these on either side, and I multiplied both sides by PB, See, the, multiply PB inverse by PB, I'd get the identity. And then multiply the identity by PB, I get PB. All right. All right. And let's, uh, let's test this out, right? Let's test this statement. All right. See that they are indeed equal. Um, well, I'll check this statement first. 
right? So, I mean, it should work out if I've done everything correctly. So, is you know, is PB times ma my standard matrix equal to that matrix representation with respect to B times PB again? Right. So, if these are equal, you know, then I have found an invertible matrix. You know, where this happens, that means A and this TB are similar. All right, so PB times A would be 3, negative 1, negative 5, 2. And then the standard matrix I have here is this 1, 2, negative 2, 3. When I multiply these, I'm getting, you know, 3 minus 2, I'm getting 1. Then negative 6 plus negative 3, negative 9. Then negative 5 plus 4, negative 1, and then 10 plus 6, 16. And do I get the same thing when I take the that matrix representation with respect to B and multiply it by PB? All right, so the matrix representation was here. All right, so these are s some hairier numbers. Um, maybe I'll use the calculator. If I take... You know, that matrix representation with respect to basis B, the negative 43, negative 26, 78, and 47, and multiply that by PB, right, the 3, negative 5, oops, sorry, there it is, right? 3, negative 5, negative 1, 2. Um, hopefully I'm getting the same thing. So first row, first column, see I'm getting negative 129 plus 130. That is 1. So far they're matching. Then 43 minus 52. Negative 9. Amazing. So far they're good. Then uh, 234 mm, minus 235. Negative 1. Wow. Looking, looking great. And then negative 78 plus uh, 94. Hey, amazing. 16. I mean, they should have been, right? But they are equal. Look at that. So that tells me that A and this uh, matrix representation of the, tran of, the, of the operator with respect to B, these are similar. Um, and another thing, right? Just to playing around with this equation here, right? uh, like I did on an earlier page, you, you could also s f use this equation, yeah. You because know, you're, you know, finding that matrix representation was a little hairy, right? A little tedious. But finding the standard matrix and this transition matrix w wasn't that bad, right? Um, really wasn't that that much involved. It involved a couple of, you know, augment, augmented matrix. So remember, we could also use this here. Say that tr you know the matrix representation with respect to B, and you know solve for this. Multiply by PB inverse on both sides is equal to PB times A times PB inverse. Right? So remember PB was this transition matrix, the 3, negative 5, negative 1, 2 here. A was the standard matrix, right, the 1, 2, negative 2, 3. And as I said earlier, right, PB inverse is simply the matrix where the columns are the vectors from B. So 2, 5, 1, 3. And this should be equal to that matrix representation of T with respect to B, that uh, that negative 43, negative 26, 78, and 47. Right. And again, you can double check this. This should work. I mean, since this worked out, 
Right? Since this worked out, this should work as well, and you can you can verify it if you wish on your own. Wow. All right. So remember what? Now uh, again, in my previous video, I talked about similar matrices. You know, and we're saying here that the standard matrix of a linear operator is going to be similar to you know the matrix representation of that same operator with respect to a different basis right? a different basis for the domain and codomain remember some results of this some properties of uh, similar matrices one of those was that they're de you know if two matrices are similar their determinants are going to be equal. All right, and let's check that. All right, let's check that. What is the determinant of A? All right, the determinant of A. Now, A is this this matrix here. Right? There was the standard matrix. It's a simple two by two, right? So three plus t four, right? Three minus negative four, three plus four, seven. The determinant of B, oh, I put B, didn't I? It should be this, uh, this matrix here. Right, this should be the determinant, sorry, I meant, I meant to write the determinant of that trend, of that matrix representation with respect to basis B. That's what I meant. This should also be 7. Alright, and here it is here. So if you take negative 43 times 47 and then subtract negative 26 times 78 I should get 3. Alright, let's see if that works out. All right. So negative 43 times uh, 47 And then my, you know, you'll have minus a negative, so I'm just going to put plus the 26 times 78. Right, and this should also be 3, right? If they truly are similar matrices, their determinant should be the same. I mean, I'm sorry, 7. Right? I said it was 7 earlier. Ugh, sorry. All over the place all of a sudden. But look, both the determinant of the standard matrix the determinant of this matrix rep uh, representation with respect to B are both 7. So that means they're both invertible, right? If their determinants are both non-zero. So that means that both, you know, they're either, remember they're either both two similar matrices are either both invertible or both not invertible. And that comes from the fact that they'll have the same determinant. All right, they're both invertible. Uh, they'll have the same rank and also the same nullity, right? So the rank of the standard matrix should be equal to the rank of that matrix representation with respect to B. And, and both of these would be two, right? Since they're invertible, all right, that means that the you know, if the determinant's not zero, if it's invertible, that means that both columns, both column vectors are independent. You have two column, two independent column vectors. So rank two, I remember that was the dimension of the column space or the dimension of the row space. I'm not going to get into all that again, right? Uh, and both of them would have a nullity of zero then, right? Because remember, rank plus nullity should be equal to the, the number of columns. And then another, one other result that came of this from my last video was that the spectrum of A would be equal to the spectrum of the matrix representation with respect to B. Uh, the spectra of both matrices are equal. Now remember, the spectrum of a matrix was the set of all its eigenvalues, right? So, the, so if you went and found the eigenvalues of A, matrix A up here, and find the eigenvalues of this matrix, right, this, this matrix representation with respect to B, they have the same, they'll have the same eigenvalues, right? 
similar matrices have the same eigenvalues. Great. All right, not necessarily the same eigenvectors, by the way. Right? Just because you have the same eigenvalues doesn't mean you have the same eigenvectors relative uh, corresponding to those values. Just be aware of that. Okay, great. Um, and this should happen for any linear operator, what I've just shown here. For any linear operator, the standard matrix, you know, if you're working with the standard basis of both the domain and codomain, and some non-standard basis for both the domain and codomain, the, sa the same non-standard basis on both sides, then your standard matrix and the matrix representation relative to that non-standard basis should will always be similar. Right? And in fact, it kind of goes back and forth. Um, you know, if you are given two bases, if you if you have a linear operator, and you're given two bases, you know, one one well, maybe the standard basis for both, and then another non-standard basis for both. That will give you, you know, you, you can find two matrix representations, you know, one with respect to the standard basis, one with respect to the non-standard basis, and those two matrices will be similar. And it goes the other way around, too. If you're given two similar matrices, then you should be able to find, you know, a linear operator and two bases that those matrices uh, are, you know, representing the, the, the operator with respect to those certain bases. You should be able to take two similar matrices and find an operator, right, a linear operator that corresponds to those two, you know, with respect to two different bases. All right. Now, this one here, you know, in this example, our matrix representation of T with respect to B wasn't very nice. You know, lots of little big uh, crazy you know some big numbers and there were four non-zero entries all four entries were non-zero and you know what if I had to square this matrix what if you know what if I had to perform the operation twice you know do uh, compose T with T or three times then this would be cubed and four times this would be to the fourth you know what if I had to do this operation more and more in, in succession uh, then I'd have to raise this matrix to many higher, 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 and higher powers, and that would be a hard thing to do, right? You know, especially with these numbers. So let's see what happens in my next example. All right. All right so same thing. Given a linear operator from R3 to R3 this time, so my my matrices, you know, standard matrix or any matrix representation, will be a three by three. Uh, and here's the rule, right? And then uh, now the question is again, you know, I want to find the standard matrix, right? So the matrix representation relative to the standard basis, which I have written here for R3. And then I'll find that matrix representation relative to the basis, this non-standard basis B. All right, let's see what happens. So first, the standard matrix, the matrix representation relative to the standard basis for the domain and codomain. So I'm hoping you see it, you know. When I plug in 1, 0, 0, I'm getting 0, 1, 0. I'm just, you know, the, co you know, the, 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 the first column of the standard matrix will just be the coefficients of x because I'm replacing 1 with x and y and z are zeros. So the coefficients of x down this are 0, 1, and 0. And then the second column, where I'm replacing x, y, z with 0, 1, 0, so I'd only get the coefficients of y, right, because x and z are 0. So 2, negative 1, and 0. And then the third column of the standard matrix, I'm plugging in the standard basis vector, 0, 0, 1. So can you see I only get the coefficients of z because you know x and y are zero and z is one, so zero, zero, one. Alright. 
So here's you know what I was calling matrix A, right? The, the standard matrix. Next, I'm going to find that matrix representation for T relative to this basis B. Right? So where I'm looking at basis B on this side, you know, for both the domain and codomain R3. Right, so first I'm going to find, you know, the images. So what is T? Uh, what's the image of the first B vector, negative 1, 1, 0, under T? So x is negative 1, y is 1, 0 is z. So I have 2 times 1, uh, then uh, negative 1 minus 1, and then 0. All right, now something I'm noticing here. See how this output? is simply a scalar multiple of the input, right? Isn't the output here just negative 2 times that input vector? Okay, so, anyway. so that means that this vector is an eigenvector of t. It's a vector that when I plug it in, you know, my output is simply a scalar multiple of, of the input. And then this negative 2 is an eigenvalue of t. Yeah. OK, uh, how about t of the second b vector, basis b vector 2, 1, 0? So I plug in 2 for x, 1 for y, 0 for z. So 2 times 1, 2, 2 minus 1. 1 and 0. Hey, look at this. Yet again, I have an eigenvector. See how the input gives me, you know, maps to an output that is a scalar multiple of it. In fact, it is just 1 times 2, 1, 0. So 2, 1, 0, right, would be an eigenvector of t. 1 would be an eigenvalue of t, you know, corresponding to 2, 1, 0. Let's see if this trend continues. I mean, I picked this example on purpose. How about what does t do to the third basis b vector, 0, 0, 1? All right, well, we already saw that. Uh, that just gives me the coefficients of z, right? I plug in 0 for x, 0 for y, 1 for z. I have 0 here, 0 minus 0 here, and 1 there. So look at this, oh my gosh. Another eigenvector, right, where the, uh, where the output is just a scalar multiple of the input. And in fact, it's just one times that input. All right, so what I'm, so I don't need to go to the whole, um, that, that uh, make that augmented matrix and put it in reduced echelon form to get the coordinates of this relative to basis B. I have them right here, pretty much. So if I would like the coordinates of these images, you know, to make the columns for this matrix representation, I want the coordinates of the images. I want those images relative to basis B. All right, so what are the coordinates of T of, you know, negative 1, 1, 0 relative to basis B? Again, they're right there. Look at, now look at the order basis B comes in, these vectors, this ordered basis. See, the, uh, see this T, T of negative 1, 1, 0 is this. I have negative 2 times negative 1, 1, 0. So I have negative 2 times that first vector from B, and then 0 of the other two. All right, this is negative 2 of the first vector 
from b, and then none of the other two. So the coordinates are simply negative 2 of the first vector, so negative 2 on the first component of the coordinate vector, and then 0 of the other two. So this is going to be the first column of my uh, matrix representation with respect to b. So you see how easy that was? Right? You see how easy it is when you have when you, when your bases when your when their basis vectors are eigenvectors of the transformation. Well, how about the next one? You know the t of two one zero. What are the coordinates of t of two one zero? You know with respect to basis b, of course. So again, going back to the basis b vectors. Right. Here are the basis b vectors here. And look at t of 2, 1, 0 is just 2, 1, 0. It's one of this second vector and none of the first and third. I've got none of that vector, one of the second vector, and zero of the third vector. So the coordinate vector of this image with respect to the basis b, I have zero of the first vector, zero of that negative 1, 1, 0. I have one of the second vector and I have zero of the third vector. And there's there's gonna that's gonna be the second column of the matrix representation with respect to B. And then finally, right, for the third column, you know, what's what's the what are the coordinates of this T of zero zero one relative to basis B? Now look at the output again. This is the, the output is just zero zero one. It's one of that third vector in basis B. I have one of that vector as an output, and none of these other two. So the coordinates are zero of the first, zero of the second, and one of the third. So zero, zero, one. And then putting these all together as our columns, I'm getting this. The matrix representation of T with respect to basis B is the matrix with the first column, negative 2, 0, 0. Second column, 0, 1, 0. Third column, 0, 0, 1. What a very simple matrix that is. All right. What a very simple matrix. And this is one of, this is actually probably the simplest kind of square matrix you're ever going to come across. All right, remember this is called a, a diagonal matrix. All right, remember the, the, a matrix where the only non-zero entries are down the main, di a, uh, down the main diagonal. Right, this is called a diagonal matrix. And do you see how down the main diagonal those values that occurred are just, you know, these eigenvalues, negative 2, 1, and 1, that showed up earlier. So that's something to point out. That's something to point out. All right, the diagonal entries for this particular example are the eigenvalues of t of the transformation. And uh, now again, you can find that pb if you want. Right? I can find pb if I wish, and I'm going to. And we'll see that my, again, like last example, this standard matrix I had earlier. Right, from the standard basis of P3 to the standard basis of P3. And this matrix for the transformation from the basis B of R3, R, sorry, R3, I said P3 earlier. This matrix from basis, you know, tr uh, from basis B of R3 to basis B of R3 again, they're similar. They are similar. All right, so I'll do that. PB, I'll find that transition matrix. Right. So 
I'm going to find that PB here. Oh, I remember that P. Oh, I'm going to do it this way instead. I remember PB inverse is just the matrix with the vectors from B in it, right? Which were negative one, one, zero in the same order, right? Two, one, zero, and zero, zero, one. So then, P, remember PB inverse is the matrix where the vector, the columns are vectors from B. So PB is just the inverse of that, right? Um, so I'll go to the calculator. We'll just pop in that three by three matrix. So I'm just entering three by three matrix with these entries, negative one, two, uh, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one. All right, this is called matrix A on my calculator. So I'll just find A inverse. That's the second matrix A. And then the little inverse button, this x to the negative 1 guy here. All right, so here, uh, I'll change it to, I know those are thirds, negative 1 third and a third, but I'll just change it to a fraction so I can see the whole thing without scrolling. All right, so here we go. All right, so PB, this transition matrix from the standard basis of R3 to basis B, is, you know, negative 1 third, Two thirds, zero, uh, then one third, one third, zero, and then zero, zero, one. Or if you'd like, uh, notice all these thirds in here. I'm going to pull a third out of this. That'd be times the matrix negative one, two, zero, one, one, zero. And then zero, zero, three, right? A third of three is one. Right. So that's PB. Now I, I should be able to use this, right? Um, you know, remember this 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 statement should be true, right? PB times the standard matrix uh, should be equal to that matrix representation multiplied by PB. Or my matrix representation should be equal to PB times A times PB inverse. And we can check this, right? So PB is this one third times the this guy here, right? Times the other A, the standard matrix I had earlier that was here. And then PB inverse, remember, is just that vector with the uh, that matrix with the B vectors as columns. All right, let's see if this is actually going to give me that diagonal matrix I got earlier where, you know, negative 2, 1, and 1 were down the main diagonal. And that better be the case, right? So in multiplying this stuff, so I'll do, uh, I'll do these two first, get another 3 by 3. 
So I had to get, you know, two, basically just, you know, all right, so two, two, zero, then negative one minus one, negative two, two minus one is one, then zero, 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 and zero, zero, one. All right. And then multiplying that by this, See what we get, and don't forget there's this one third out here. All right. All right, so we get one third of another three by three. All right, got negative two minus four. It's negative six. Then negative two plus two plus zero. Then zero zero zero. Uh, then two minus two plus zero zero, and then. 2 plus 1 plus 0, 3, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3. And when I put this 1 third in, a third times every entry, right, we get negative 2, 1, 1 down the main diagonal, 0 everywhere else, exactly what I got earlier. Right. That was my matrix representation with respect to basis B. I found on the previous page, right? Exactly the same thing. All right. Now, diagonal matrices are nice. They're very nice. Um, oh, I guess before I get to this. So remember, this matrix here, right? This matrix here and matrix A are similar. So they should have the same determinant. Determinant of a diagonal matrix is super easy. It's the product of the diagonal entries. So negative two, the determinant of this matrix would be negative two. Now this one's not so hard to take either because there's a lot of zeros, but still, it would have a determinant of negative two as well, since they're similar. Um, they have the same. You know, they're both invertible since you know the determinants are non-zero. They would both have the same rank of three, clearly three, because there are three pivots here. You can very easily put this into reduced echelon form by multiplying that top row by negative one half. See that every column is a pivot column. They both have a rank of three, a nullity of zero, um, and they both have the same eigenvalues. Again, diagonal matrix, real easy, real easy. Diagonal matrix eigenvalues are just the the, the values on the diagonal, negative 2, 1, and 1. So if you were to take this matrix here and find its eigenvalues, it would also they would also be negative 2 and 1. And that's 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 awesome. All right. But like I said, diagonal matrices are very nice. You would actually prefer to work with diagonal matrices in most cases in, in your life you know, studying linear algebra. So I've got a few big results here, you know, big reasons why diagonal matrices are so nice, right? Um, the reason why, you know, uh, so diagonal matrices are, say, the nicest square matrices. It depends on what you find is nice or not. Um, you know, obviously, I find them very, you know, they're very easy to work with. Because like, so all right, so suppose we have a diagonal matrix. All right, suppose D is a diagonal matrix. So remember, a diagonal matrix is a square matrix, n by n matrix, where the only non-zero entries are down. The, now, some of them could be zero, but the, if if there are any non-zero entries, they're on the main diagonal. So D one one, D two two, you know, to D n n, right? And then every other entry off the main diagonal is a zero. So the beautiful thing about diagonal matrices is the following things. You know, make it make make them easy to work with. One, the determinant of a diagonal matrix is simply the product of the diagonal entries. D11 times you know D22 times all the way to DNN. And uh, if none of these are zero, then it's invertible. 
right? The determinant's not zero, and if the determinant's not zero, it's invertible, and the inverse is, again, very simple. The inverse of a diagonal matrix is another diagonal matrix where you just take the reciprocals of those main diagonal entries, so 1 over d11, 1 over d22, 1 over dnn, and then every other entry off the main diagonal is zero. Again, so very simple. Uh, since it's diagonal, you know, and all these entries off the main diagonal are zero, a diagonal matrix is what they call symmetric. Right? A symmetric matrix is one that's equal to its own transpose. So if you take the transpose of a diagonal matrix, it's still that same diagonal matrix. Nothing changes. And then here's the big one, right, which I'll get to in the next video after this. The di a di if you take a diagonal matrix and raise it to an integer power, say to the kth power, so d times d times d times d, you know, k times, you're simply going to get another diagonal matrix where the entries down the diagonal are just the entries down the original diagonal to the kth power. So d11 to the kth power, d22 to the kth power. Right? So if you're squaring a matrix, it's just d11 squared, d22 squared, dnn squared. Down the main diagonal is zero everywhere else. Right? It's still a diagonal matrix. You know, if you raise it to the third power, all these are cubed now, right? The same, and so on and so forth. Very, very nice. And finally, again, there are mu there are I'm sure there are other properties that I'm not stating here. But the spectrum of a diagonal matrix is just the set with the values down the main diagonal. Right? The, remember, the spectrum is all the, the set of all the eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues of a diagonal matrix are just the values down the main diagonal. So the set with d11, d22 up to dn in. Incredible, right? A lot of very easy results to, to remember and very easy to work with these diagonal matrices are. So a big question that arises from this video, right, a big question that arises when you're working with a linear operator and talking about, you know, the standard matrix being similar to, you know, a matrix representation with respect to another basis, right, some basis B. The big question that will be answered in the next video, and I'll briefly kind of, kind of answer it here too, is suppose you're given a linear operator, you know, t from you know, v to v, the same you know, vector space to the same vector space. The question is, is there a basis b of v, or is there a basis of v Right, both of these, such that the matrix representation of T with respect to B is a diagonal matrix. Another way of asking that, an equivalent way, an equivalent question, is suppose you're given a square matrix A. Right? So remember, every, every linear operator can be represented by a square standard matrix called A. Is there an invertible matrix P such that P inverse times A times P is equal to D, where D is a diagonal matrix? And the answer is, you know, yes or no, depends on, uh, we'll see what kind of matrices this, this will happen for. We're going to see in the next video when the answer to this question is yes and when the answer to this question is no. When the answer to the question is yes, this matrix P that we're talking about here is that PB inverse. Right? P is the PB inverse, that transition matrix with respect to B, you know, to tr transition to, from the standard basis to B inverse. Because right? this is P, that's like P inverse here. Well, just to give you a little hint, 
if we look back at when this was diagonal, all right, for this example here, all right, the last example I did in the video, for this operator and this basis, all right, for this operator and this basis, the matrix representation with respect to that basis was diagonal. And look, I kind of said this out loud without writing it. And here's a little clue for you for the next video. What kind of basis does that? What kind of basis for a linear operator, for, for the domain and codomain of a linear operator, gives me a, a matrix representation that's diagonal? Every, we saw, when I was taking the images of these, we saw that every single one of these vectors was an eigenvector. And, and these are, in fact, independent. We have independent eigenvectors in this basis. All right, and that's going to get that's my little hint for you for the next video. You'll see that when a basis is made up of, you know, if we're going from an n-dimensional vector space to an n-dimensional vector space, we'll see that the only time this will happen that your trans your matrix representation with respect to a basis is diagonal. The only time this will happen is if our basis is made up of n, in this case 3, right, independent eigenvectors. And then the gorgeous thing is that the tra that matrix representation will be diagonal, and those entries down the diagonal are the eigenvalues of the transformation, or the eigenvalues of a matrix, corresponding to these eigenvectors in that order. It's, it's, it's very beautiful, and you're going to really appreciate that in the next video. So I hope you enjoyed this and you know, enjoy practicing problems of this nature where you're finding a standard, you know, finding a matrix, finding a matrix representation with respect to a different basis for a linear operator, showing that they're similar, and then again, we'll get into the next video where we answer that question, what kinds of bases for a linear operator make it so that my matrix representation with respect to that basis is diagonal, a beautiful diagonal matrix. All right. well, thank you very much for watching.